20th day of May 2019, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar, and this indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcasting live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, also heard in a variety of other places. Do appreciate you for tuning in on this particular moon day or Monday. Anyway, guess what we have. Now, last week we were going to start off a brand new series with Jordan Maxwell, uh, but something got in the way, so we're doing it this week. And this week we are beginning the series on astrotheology. Now, uh, this is a fascinating topic and has already got me some uh, discussions. I'm getting a little feedback from you, Jordan, just so you know through your speakers there. Um Anyway, this is a fascinating topic, which has already gotten some reactions uh, from you, the listeners, and some questions, and I even have one waiting in the chat room. But I have Jordan Maxwell waiting on the line, and, uh, you know, glad to have him with us. Almost thought we weren't going to do this today, too, because there was actually a little difficulty with Jordan's Internet earlier in the day, <laughs> and we thought we might have to cancel. But thankfully, no, Jordan is with us. Anyway, how are you, sir? How are you doing tonight? I think, okay, we'll find out soon. <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, there's only one way to really find out is when you actually start doing stuff, if you're ready to do stuff, right? <laughs> yep, that's it. Uh, and, and that's the thing. Um, anyway, astrotheology. Now, the first thing is I, I've seen this written in a lot of different places. And initially, immediately, and before we even approached the first day we were supposed to start the show, um, it was funny because I had to send you a message and say, do you mean astral theology or do you mean astro theology? Because I see it written both ways. I see it associated to you both ways. Uh, obviously, here, here's another one of those things where other people have, have clearly utilized your work, your words, your imagery. In fact, you, in some cases, clips of you directly in order to make their points regarding both of these things. Um, but there is a difference, isn't there? Well, I'm not sure how much of a difference, because they're using the same words. It's just the way you're writing them on paper. So I'm not sure if there's really <clears throat> that much of a difference, because we're talking about theology, religion, based on the stars. Hmm. Well, right, but see, astral theology uh, apparently goes into a slightly different direction from astro theology and jordan corrected me and told me it's astro like uh, like the baseball team used to be the astros right astro yep, right. theology so uh with the o not the i a l just so we got that straight off the bat but um this this is a good thing because again your work has been utilized by other people it's been referenced, it's been stolen, it's been, well, plagiarized, it's been picked up, it's been pointed out as an example, it's been mutilated all over the place. So, uh, I think it is best to start with an introduction for, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but almost like astrotheology for dummies. Let's begin from the very beginning. And uh, quite frankly, a couple of listeners who are familiar with you, familiar with your work, they're familiar with me, they're familiar with a lot of different ideas. A bunch of them actually said, I hope Jordan starts from the ABCs here. Uh, and there's a, a, a interesting thing in the chat room, if you don't mind, um, which is really more of an observation from uh, Ammon, who, let's see if I can roll this around here and get it for you real quick. <laughs> uh, it says, I have a question for Jordan ahead of the new Astro Theology show. It's about the uh, constellation of Orion. Uh, it's the only constellation that I can recognize and always seem to see whenever I look up at the stars. Uh, I was amazed to learn that the pyramids in Egypt and Mexico are in perfect alignment to the three stars of Orion. So it obviously had significance to those people. And then he goes on to say, so not so much uh, a question, but I'm intrigued by this and uh, would like to know more. I assume you and Jordan will do an uh, introduction to astrotheology uh, for newbies. Well, uh, I hope. It said, then it says, I hope, slash I hope. Uh, I hope so anyway. Uh, so that... Uh, so, the, oh, cause I am. <laughs> anyway, thanks again, uh, Chuck and Jordan for a, uh, fantastic show. Okay. 
Sorry, I had a little trouble reading that because of the way my internet is behaving at the moment. <laughs> but um, mm, okay. anyway, it is it is what it is. There, there's a bit of a electronic disturbance, it seems, in the universe at the moment. But uh, but I got through it, um, and I think that this is uh, this is a relevant question. Uh, people see stuff all around them that uh, uh, appears to present synchronicity, and a lot of ideas have been kind of pushed around out there. So. Uh, I say we take it from the very beginning. How would you introduce this to somebody who just says, you know, Jordan, I see that there is a relationship between religion and the stars and all of that, but I don't know where to begin to sort it out. How would you begin to lay this out to somebody? Well, I know it's, it's, it is quite a big subject. It's been around for thousands of years. <clears throat> First of all, uh, their religion today is based on, f I, I guess you could say, four different basic concepts that came out of the ancient world. <clears throat> First of all, the idea that God, where is God? Well, <clears throat> most people would immediately think he's. they would point out there into the sky, God's out there. So therefore, if he's out there, he's not from here. So he's out there. Therefore, we're talking about the idea that God is in the heavens. And therefore, the idea being is that the whole idea of religion is based on a power that's out there in the heavens that dominates our galaxy, dominates our lives, our planet. <clears throat> and so we call it God, for a lack of a better term. And um, when you begin to see how our religions today have finally come down to us today and understand where those ideas that we express today in religion, where they originated, <clears throat> then it begins to make a lot more sense what these ideas were in the original. And so the single most important symbol in mankind's history, you could go back to the very first man, whatever that was. You could go all the way back into the ancient world, as far back as you can go. <clears throat> and, it, and it seems that, that, that the most important symbol in man's life has been the sun. Because without the sun, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't even be alive without the sun. Because the sun is pure energy. And it is providing energy for us to grow our food and for us to grow. <clears throat> without the sun, we would be frozen over. We would, nobody would be here. So you asked the question first about ancient ideas about religion and God. If the sun is the most important symbol in the life of the human race on the earth, uh, there seems to be more to this idea that the sun is important. I think it's far, far more important than we even begin to suspect. <clears throat> so the question I ask first, when you want to understand the Bible story of Jesus, the New Testament, is to ask the question, <clears throat> who owns the sun? Because that's the basis for Christianity. Who owns the sun? That thing that comes up in the morning that brings light into our world. <clears throat> you Well, since nobody on the earth can claim ownership of the sun, <clears throat> excuse me, it would, it would appear that the most logical answer would be God owns the sun. And if God owns the sun, then it's his sun, not ours. And so <clears throat> Jesus is referred to as God's son. S-U-N, God's son, the light of the world. He is referred to in the Bible. Jesus is referred to as the light of the world. Well, of course, our son is the light of this world. What else lights the earth 
and the world we live in if it's not the sun. <clears throat> so therefore, you now begin to see the beginnings of Christianity's ideas. The sun never was worshipped. People talk about the sun worshippers or the ancient sun worshippers. But in point of fact, no one actually ever worshipped the sun as a god. The sun was always referred to <clears throat> as a typical example of what we humans would think about God, the qualities that God would have. God would first of all have to be obviously very powerful, well, the sun is very powerful. God would also be the one who would give light to the earth so that we who were created with eyes and all creatures with eyes could see, but you can't see without light. And so God would obviously give us light so we could see. And so the sun is the light of the world so that we can all see <clears throat> with the sun. So therefore, the sun is referred to as God's son. Jesus is referred to as God's son, the light of the world. Of course, the sun is the light of the world. And then, of course, it would follow <clears throat> that every morning the sun rises. And so the sun, when it rises, is bringing life to you. Because without the sun, there would be no energy. We wouldn't be alive. So therefore, he is our savior. He's the one that keeps us alive. So God's son is our risen savior. Of course, it rises every morning. And so once you begin to see the encoded message in the New Testament, it's an encoded uh, metaphor. It's telling you something about human life on the earth, but it is not history. It is a metaphor. It's a symbolic story. Mm -hmm. And it's telling you that light comes from the sun, and nobody owns the sun but God. So it's God's son, the light of the world, and he is our risen Savior. Of course, our son is our risen Savior. <clears throat> and... So from there, you begin to put the story together, that the sun has 12 helpers, <clears throat> the 12 signs of the zodiac, or the 12 months of the year. And each month helps the sun to distribute his light on the earth. So each one of the apostles were part of the light of God. And so this is why Jesus is God's son, the light of the world. And he has 12 followers. He had 12 apostles of followers, just as Joseph has 12 brothers and the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12, high, the 12 stones on the high priest's breastplate. Everything in the Bible, a lot of stuff in the Bible in the, in the numerology of 12. So 12 is very big in the Bible. Why? Because it's all based on ancient, ancient astrology. And so we now know that there are 12 months of the year, 12 hours of daytime, 12 hours of night. Everything is in divisions of 12. And so the whole idea of Christianity is based on God's Son, the light of the world, who is our risen Savior, and, of course, the sun is your risen Savior. Thank God it does rise every morning. If it doesn't rise, <clears throat> we're going to be dead in about three weeks, the whole earth. And so, therefore, the sun is pure energy. And the ancient peoples realized and said, <clears throat> and they understood that the sun is pure energy. Energy is life. Therefore, if the sun were to somehow or another keep its light to itself and not share it with us out here in space, if the sun were to keep its light, it would keep its own energy and would probably last forever because it's pure energy, pure life. But because the sun is giving its energy every day to us on the earth so that we can live 
God's Son is giving us life. And so we live because he is giving his life for us. Right. So God's son dies each day because every day he dies a little bit, just like we do. The day we're born, we begin to die just a little bit every day. <clears throat> and so the son, when it comes up in the morning, is dying a little bit every day. And one day, a long time from now, but one day it will finally run out. And when it does, it's going to go out for good and there'll be no more sun. Right. <clears throat> and so we uh, so therefore you can say that the son is giving his life a little bit every day to us so god's son has died is died giving his life for us well let me let me interject something here give, give you a second to think about where you want to go next because to me this is a story that a lot of people can begin to see encoded in christianity sure uh, and, and in, in the, the Bible story. Okay. I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here, but it's not just there. It's actually within the culture. It's actually a universal truth that seems to have been known by the ancient people very much like that listener mentioned in the chat room there. You know, they see the, the temples lining up and this kind of thing. Okay. But before we get to that complexity, in the language today as we speak, as you and I sit here, Jordan, the idea of uh, someone being a star or the fact that stars are utilized in almost every uh, symbology that there is, mm. they're actually variations uh, that represent the star. It's not a star. It's the star that is of most importance to us. And that includes the, the stars that they use to note authority, uh, badges, things like that, right? Uh, the, Correct. The various stars that are used in nations' banners. I mean, take a look at how many banners have stars. Why do they all have stars? Why do you call someone the star of a project or a genre or something like that in entertainment. They are the star of this. They are the star because the star is the thing that everything else happens around. It is the most important thing. And it's sort of like a truth that is continuously repeated, uh, uh, no matter whether it's a secular idea or it's a religious idea or it's an ancient religion. It's being repeated over and over and over again to right. to acknowledge that the star over our heads, you know, I mean, look, there are many stars. There are billions of stars, whatever, you know, like, like, uh, uh what, what's his name used to say on Cosmos, right? Billions and billions of stars, right? Jordan, <laughs> that, that's true. But those stars are not of the same kind of importance to us as that one over our heads, just <laughs> like you explained. So really what we're doing is repeating that that star is the important thing to us. It's a star, it's a star, it's a star. And yes, some are five-pointed, some are six-pointed, some are eight-pointed. There's all kinds out there, but every time you see that, that's almost like the repetition in the culture of the acknowledgement of the key star, which is the sun it is what is over our heads i mean that that seems kind of basic for me to say it that way but but doesn't that make sense as well that's exactly right okay that's the way it, that's the way the ancient people saw it the sun is a star <clears throat> and it rises in the east and so that's why the women have masonic orders called the eastern star because the sun is a star that rises in the east. and But my point in this whole program being that Christianity is based on the idea that the sun is the basis for life on the earth for everything. Mm -hmm. For fish, for birds, animals, humans. Uh, you know, whatever is alive on the earth is alive because of the energy that comes from the sun. And remember that there's only one sun for us. We don't have four of them or five of them. There's only one. And so Jesus represents that one sun. He is the only begotten son, the only begotten son of our Father in heaven. 
And so, therefore, the Bible says that when you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. Because no man has ever seen God. <clears throat> but if you see the Son, you've seen the Father, Jesus said. If you see the Son, you've seen the Father. Why? Because the Father, being God, God the Father, has provided you with life. He's given you life. He's given you warmth. He's given you light. He's given you food and kept your earth warm for you. And the flowers grow and the food grows. So therefore, God is, <clears throat> is an idea of your Father. He's the one that's given you life. He's God the Father. And so the Son represents God. He is the offspring of the Most High God. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is said to be God's Son, the only begotten Son. Why? Because there's only one here. We only have one, only one begotten Son. <clears throat> and so the whole idea being, for the first time you need to understand the story of Jesus in the New Testament as a metaphor and a spiritual story of the war between light and darkness, between good and evil, between the obvious white light of the sun that brings life into the world, that grows your plants, it grows your food, it keeps your, it keeps your world warm so that you can continue to grow and live and it gives you food, so it's feeding you. So God's Son is the light of the world. He is your risen Savior, and he is the one that is giving his light so that you might live. That's right. He's giving his energy so that you might have a body and you might live. So he's dying to give you life. He died on a cross to give you life. And that three, those three... Um, Star, those three stars in Orion were referred to back in the ancient world as the three wise men. Mm -hmm. The three wise men that came to see Jesus was actually the three stars in Orion. And when you draw a straight line from the three stars, you draw a straight line, and it will go down into the southern hemisphere, <clears throat> and it will end up on something that's called the Southern Cross. And so the Southern Cross is a, is a constellation of stars. And this is why when the sun goes down into the south, it goes all the way down to Rio. And that's why the birds fly south for the winter because they are not, they're not stupid. They don't stay here and work. They fly down and stay in the sun. We don't. We just stay here and work. <clears throat> and so the idea is that the Bible story of the New Testament is telling you about the life of our son all year long. From there are, there are four different times that the sun impacts our world: in the spring, the summer, the autumn, and the and the winter. So it's four different seasons. This is why we have in the Bible four different books telling you the story: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. Four seasons for the four, the four, uh, gospels of the, of the Bible is based on the four seasons. And we know that because some of the very first Christian founders and Christian fathers of the Christian congregation thousands of years ago said that. They said that Jesus represents the sun and it's rising. And so it was a wonderful, metaphysical, strange, uh, encoded, symbolic story about the life of mankind on the earth for countless thousands and thousands of years we have lived on the earth, and that therefore we've come to realize that there's just a story going on, the story of life on the earth. And without the sun, God's sun, the light of the world, there would be no life on the earth. So <clears throat> the ancient peoples, especially the Native Americans, have said nobody actually worships the sun as a god. But we are saying that the attributes of the sun 
naturally reflect what we would think about God. We think that God would be a wonderful and powerful. Well, the Son is wonderful and powerful. And God would give us life. Well, the Son does give us life. It gives us energy. <clears throat> And that uh, God would be uh, gracious enough to give us light, so why give us eyes if we can't see? Obviously, God has given us a light so we can see, a light by day and a light by night. So what I'm saying is that there's a very big and ancient story in the New Testament that is basically telling us that the whole uh, bottom line at the end of the day after hearing all the different ministers and preachers and churches and religions, the bottom line is that in Christianity is that Jesus represents the Son. Because if you go back into the ancient, and I do mean ancient Greek, in the ancient Greek world, the Son was spelled I-E-S-O-U-S, Aesus. Aesis was a word in the ancient Greek world for the sun, and therefore eyes are interchangeable with J's. Why? Because eyes, like a J, are just straight up and down, but the J has a little tail on the end of it, and it makes it a J. But eyes and J's look the same. Without that little tail on the J, eyes and J's look the same. And so I's and J's can be interchanged, which they have been in history. <clears throat> so therefore, if the sun was I-E-S-O-U-S, you take the I and make it a J, because J-E-S-O-U-S, or J-E-S-U-S, hmm. Jesus. Jesus is Isis, Isis. Isis is the sun, God's sun, the light of the world. Back to the same subject again. So all the mankind, I don't care how far back you go, have always realized the most important thing in your life is the sun. Bottom line, period. Without the sun, we're dead. We have no food. We're going to freeze to get death. And you think the, the, the ice is thick at the Antarctica? Yeah, wait till you see what the earth is going to look like when there's no sun and there's no heat. <clears throat> mm. So that's the bottom line on the New Testament story of Jesus. Is that it's a story about light against darkness, light at war with darkness. And we know that anything which is evil, we tend to think symbolic. Symbolically, it's, it's evil because it's in the dark. You, all the bad things you do are in the dark. All the good things you do in the public, you go out into the public at 12 noon, and whatever you're doing in the public, the world can see you. Everyone's in the light, and everyone can see what you're doing, so you're not doing something evil. Obviously, you're trying to do something of very good. You want people to see it, so you're doing it in the light. <clears throat> and we now we have those terms we use that if you're doing something evil to trick someone or or you know, create some kind of a criminal element, you're doing it in the dark. You're doing something which is very evil and doing something in the dark. So therefore, that which is evil in man's world has become known as the darkness, and we live in the dark. But, so those people who are in the dark are evil and criminal, and they're doing dark, dark deeds. But people who are doing things for the human race and trying to help the human family, they are in the light. So we say they're saintly. They're filled with light. And so they are brilliant, and they are, you know, they're shedding their light on mankind. And so the bottom line is there's a war been going on from day one. I don't care how far back you can go into history. Day one, there's always been a war going on on the air between truth and darkness. Truth and the lie. Real and not real. <clears throat> Good and evil. And therefore, God's Son is the light of the world. Our risen Savior, who is giving his life so that you might live. 
And then there is something called the Prince of Darkness. Mm -hmm. The Prince of Darkness, his name in Egypt was called Set. S-E-T was the God of Darkness in the ancient Egyptian world. And so Set was the Prince of Darkness. And today we say it gets very dark in our world at sunset. <clears throat> so I said at the beginning there's been about four basic concepts upon which religion has been based uh, for thousands of years. One, and it's, it's very difficult for me to think about which one started first. I'm not really sure which one began first, but the four of them uh, is one, the lunar cult. <clears throat> the ancient world had a very big time with the moon because mankind was fascinated with the moon. And so the moon being lunar, there was a lunar cult, a cult of people on the earth who really placed a lot of importance on the moon and had some kind of a mysterious effect on us and some kind of a strange, mysterious presence at night sitting out there all by itself in the, in the space and in our in our you know, uh, our, our, uh, what do you call it, solar system. Right. So, therefore, humans would see at night the moon, especially in the Middle East, in, in what we call Egypt, and the Middle Eastern countries, the Arabic countries, <clears throat> they were big on moon worship. Not that they worshiped the moon, but they worshiped the idea that the God of darkness was set and that the moon represented a particular kind of God. And so the moon became very important to the Arabic world. And since the so-called Arabic world was the home of Judaism, supposedly, in that area of the world, <coughs> Judaism itself was based on moon worship. And when you get into moon worship, again, we're talking about symbolism. <clears throat> and uh, and Moses, Moses was a lunar deity. Moses was not an actual man who actually lived. No, Moses was a word in the Egyptian for a moon god. Mm. And so he was a leader of a moon cult. And so the Hebrews learned about the moon cult, and they became very inv involved with the moon cult. So that today, the Hebrews today, Jews today, still hold sacred the moon. And there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole belief system about the new moon and the quarter moon, the first quarter, the last quarter, the new moon. And the full moon, it's all very important in Judaism because Judaism is connected to the Middle Eastern religions. So moon worship was one of the different cults. And, of course, the sun was a solar uh, presence. You know, we talked about that already. So the sun god uh, was Ra, and so we take the word Ra, R-A, and put a Y onto it, becomes sun ray. Ray is the sun ray, no as sun ra. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> the 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 sun god in Egypt was called a term, an official term for the sun god in Egypt was Amun, A M E N. <clears throat> Amun Ra. Amun Ra was the sun god. And so today, when Christians are in church, when they're praying to God's Son, the light of the world, at the end of their prayer, they say, Amen. <clears throat> Why? Because that's the way the sun god of Egypt was spelled. A-M-E-N hyphen R-A. Sun Ra. Or Amen Ra. <clears throat> or Amen Ray. And so... The bottom line on all of this, I'm just trying to lay out the foundations for understanding how the sun has brought us into a religion we call Christianity. And therefore, the sun represents light, L-I-G-H-T, and life, L-I-F-E. 
And so this is where the religion of Christianity really takes off and you begin to really understand Christianity when you understand that the Son, most important thing the Son does for us besides keeping us alive and keeping our earth warm, the most important thing that the Son accomplishes for us humans <clears throat> is to give us light. L-I-G-H-T. Without light, we can't see. We wouldn't be able. To, we won't be around the earth very long. And so, therefore, he is the light of the world. Mm. And therefore, Amun Re, Amen Ra, was the god of light, the god of the sun in the ancient Egyptian world. And the, and the sun has dominated all the religions of the world. All the different religions of the earth have always used the symbol of the sun. And, and more importantly, all institutions from the police department, fire department, city hall, military, universities, restaurants, I don't care what kind of business or institution the human race has come up with, Always the sun is part of the symbol of all corporations, companies, institutions, colleges, universities, police departments. The sun is the king of kings and lord of lords. I don't care how important you are as a president or a king or a prince or a princess, your symbol in your government is a sun. Therefore, we say God's Son, the light of the world, is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Why? Because everybody on the earth uses the sun as their symbol. If you're royalty, you are glowing as royalty. And so <clears throat> you begin to see how the story becomes part of the life of the human race. And it begins to grow. Now, the bottom line to all of this is very important, and that is this. Keep in mind that the light of the world represents light, which means intellectual and spiritual enlightenment. People who are ignorant, ill-informed, and couldn't care less are ignorant and ill-informed because they have inside of them no light. They live their whole life in darkness. They don't understand what's going on. They don't read. They don't care. They don't think about it. All they do is watch a ball game, they drink their beer, and they couldn't care less about understanding why things are the way they are. They don't question anything. And so, therefore, when you talk with someone, he doesn't have the faintest idea what you're talking about. We say things like he's really in the dark. This guy's in the dark. Mm. But when you are in the presence of someone who is extraordinarily bright and very intelligent and fascinating to listen to, we say this guy is brilliant. Brilliant means he's very bright. <clears throat> the other guy next to him has no light. He can he can't even find his way out of a paper bag. He's so far in the dark. But the other guy is absolutely brilliant. Is extremely bright. <clears throat> And so that's the way uh, Christianity was based on. And before Christianity existed in the Roman Empire, that's why today the Catholic Church feels it gave to the world Christianity. And that's why the Catholic Church today and the Pope actually believe, the Christian Catholics believe that it was Rome that gave to the world Christianity. When in point of fact, that's not true, because the ideas expressed in Christianity were already well formed and they were well established in the Roman Empire before Christianity ever existed. There was a religion in the Roman Empire for many, many years before Christianity ever came on the scene, and it was called Mithraism, <clears throat> Mithraism was a very powerful religion in the Roman Empire. Everybody knew about the religion of Mithra. He was the son of God. He was God's son, the light of the world. He was our risen savior. 
he had he was born of a virgin and he died on a cross and he was resurrected after three days and he came back to life and he died to give mankind life and so the whole story again going back further than Christianity was was Mithraism so it's just still the same story of the worship of the sun. And so, mm. and on understand. another nearby continent, uh, Jordan, because you mentioned Egypt before, uh, I, I think it would be appropriate to mention Horus here as well, wouldn't it? Yes, it would be. Horus was a name, a personal name, of the sun god <clears throat> in Egypt. Officially, he was referred to as Amun Re, or Amun Ra, R A. As I said, we, in the English world, we put a Y onto it. R-A-Y, ray, like a sun ray. But it's actually no, Amun-Ra, R-A. And Amun-Ra, his personal name was uh, Horus, H-O-R-U-S. And so Horus, uh, it was said that Horus walked across the sky that lucky old sun, that's all he does every day is he just walks across the sky mm. and he brings light to the world. And his name was Horus. And so the idea was in ancient Egypt, when Horus popped up in the east on the eastern horizon, he was called Horus of the first step. And then a little later, Horus moved up higher. Now he was Horus of the second step. And later on, he moves up higher, Horus of the third step. When Horus on the, on the sixth step was directly overhead, it walks across the sky. <clears throat> when it walks across the sky on the sixth step, it was now Horus of the sixth step. He's directly overhead. He now becomes the most high God. Now he's known Horus is the most high God. We see that term. In Scripture, the Most High. Why? Because the sun doesn't get any higher than 12 noon over the top of your head. Right. It's the Most High God. It don't get any higher than 12. And so <clears throat> Horus is, a, is the Most High God. So he walks across this, uh, the sky in 12 steps or 12 Horuses. So what we did in the English world, we take H-O-R-U-S, Horus, and change the U and the R, interchangeable the U and the R, and make it H-O-U-R-S, becomes 12 hours, not 12 Horus, 12 hours. And so the lucky old sun walks across the sky every day. And so if you want to say, if you want to make this story into something believable about the human life on the earth, we would say that God's son, the light of the world, uh, is his name as Horus or Hours. He walks across the, the sky in 12 hours. And as he walks across the sky, he brings light into the world. And so the word light is Lucius. Uh, it's it's called Lucius or Lux in Egypt. Lux was the light, or Latin was Lu Lucius. Therefore, in mythology, the ancient mythology, George Lucas treats us to the story of Star Wars with Luke Skywalker. Luke is light and walks across the sky. So we have Luke Skywalker, and he ult ultimately will meet and when he is at the twelfth step, at the end of the day, the twelfth step, Luke Skywalker meets the Prince of Darkness, Darth Vader, who wears the black robe and the black cape, and and he obviously is the heavy. He's the evil, the evil Prince of Darkness, and so that's why it's called a Star Wars. It's a war going on in the heavens between. Luke Skywalker, the sun that walks across the sky, and then and then the god of darkness, uh, Set S E T. So therefore, Luke Skywalker meets Darth Vader or Sun Set. So this is why I'm saying that the entire story of Christianity 
is a encoded story <clears throat> that is telling you that there has been since day one a war going on on the earth between intellectual enlightenment intellectual and spiritual enlightenment man being in the light or being ignorant and in the dark there's always been that problem where half the human race is in the dark and they have no idea in the world what's going on nobody tells them anything and their natural their their natural proclivity is to just go to work and pay your bills and drink the beer and watch TV and go to the games and entertain yourself and send the kids to college and do whatever you got to do to stay alive and that's all there is to life you just wake up every morning and earn money and pay money and pay for everything and just go and drink your beer and watch your television while other people are extraordinarily brilliant minds and they build the world. They they come up with all kinds of ideas about how to run banks, run the world, run computers, build rockets to the moon. So there's always been a war between light and darkness, and that's what the story of Christianity really is, the light of the world, Jesus represents the sun or intellectual, spiritual enlightenment. Now, following that idea, since generally speaking, the bottom line is anything in the Bible that has to do with Jesus in the New Testament, whatever is said to Jesus is what was normally said by the human family about light, about intellectual and spiritual enlightenment. Whatever happens to Jesus in the Bible, that's what happens to intellectual, spiritual enlightenment. Whatever is done to Jesus is done to spiritual and intellectual light. The idea being is that people in the dark will always persecute people in the light because they don't see, they don't have the ability to, to see what the people in the light are trying to educate them. And so <clears throat> that's why we have so many different religions and so many different people with all these different ideas about Christianity. They're all, I don't know how many thousands of different Christian denominations there are, but they're all different, and they all realize that they all have the truth. All the different Christian churches know that they have the truth. Obviously, they have the truth, because if they didn't have the truth, they would join a different Christian religion. So the Catholics know that they have the truth, and Jehovah's Witnesses got nothing. But the Mormons know they have the truth, and Jehovah's Witnesses don't have anything. And so you go down the line, all the different religions believe they have the truth, and everybody else is wrong. Obviously, if they even thought about it, but they're so far in the dark themselves, if they ever think about it, the only reason you are in a particular religion is either because you will happen by chance to have been born into it, or you were talked into it, and you joined something. And therefore, that's why you are now said to be a particular religious belief system. But it's not because you have the absolute sovereign truth of the universe. No, it's just where you happen by chance to have been born or who you happen by chance to have married and you joined their religion or you got talked into somebody else's religion. <clears throat> and so that's why there's equal amount of people in the world that have no religion. Because they're thinking about it and they don't want anything to do with religion because they don't believe the stories. And so that's what I'm trying to say. The bottom line on Christianity is an encoded symbolic story about the life of the sun and the life of the human race. How we humans view our sun as a risen savior. And he has come into this world and, and he brought light and, and wisdom and knowledge and wisdom and warmth so that we could grow food and stay alive. And so the sun was actually giving life to us so that we could live. 
So we say God's son died for us on the cross. He died for us. That's right. The sun is dying every day because it's giving away a lot of its energy every day. It's very generous. It's giving his energy to the whole universe. But one day he's going to die because he's giving his life away. <clears throat> now, when you understand the bottom line on Christianity said once and for all is a war between light and darkness in the life of mankind. That's the story of Christianity. Mm -hmm. The war between light and darkness, between intellectual, well-read understanding of life and the light, and you have the light of the world, you are, you are carrying light inside of you, and that's why Jesus said, if you're filled with light, you don't cover it up, you put it up on the mountain and let the whole world see that you are in the light. Well, you know, Jordan, as we get close to the end of this hour, um, it, it, it makes me think that we should go back to the beginning of the Jesus story again, though, because you'd, you'd mentioned about the three wise men following the sun. Right, which is in the story and the the wise men, the direction they come from and the direction Jesus is traveling in, in the narrative, all makes sense for a reason. Uh, but then there's more after that that uh, that is also explained, and uh, I wouldn't mind going into that direction with you. Uh, but you know, as I said, a lot of this stuff, if you think about it objectively, you the listener, not you, Jordan, obviously, but if you the listener think about this as you go through it, uh, and, and as Jordan and I both mentioned one way or another, this is a truth that continues to permeate the language, the communication, the symbols of authority. Uh, it was there before there was Christianity. It was there after Christianity. It's there even though it believes it's outside of Christianity because it's actually a universal story. It's a story of what's actually happening, and it's the recognition of it. And it's rather fascinating the way it continuously gets related, whether it is the Egyptian version, the Roman version, the Christian version. All of these things, in one way or another, you kind of have to acknowledge, but also understand that it is the truth which is contained, because the Bible is not a historical document. Now, that's right. that sounds like a lot to wrap your mind around, but that's why there's going to be a whole series on this. <laughs> anyway, you want to follow up some more. You're listening to this. Do you say, look, I got to follow up on this some more? Guarantee you there's one place you can go to do so. That's jordanmaxwellshow.com. It is, excuse me. Mm. Sorry about that, Jordan. It is the only website which is actually Jordan Maxwell's. It's the only place you can get a hold of him, and it's the only place that you can join the Research Society, jordanmaxwellshow.com. I'll give you the link for both, but there is a way you can just click on a link and go into the Research Society there and for a one-time fee. You can be a lifetime member of the Jordan Maxwell Research Society, and guess what? You can not only learn about astrotheology, but you can learn about all of the other things that it permeates, which is just about everything. If you think about it, uh, you know, government uh, religious symbolism, literature, uh, there's a whole lot of interesting connections to audio, video, books, suggested reading, articles, symbols, uh, images, all kinds of things are in the Jordan Maxwell Research Society. And uh, there's also a way you can go there and, you know, make a donation to Jordan. There is a donate button there. You can email him, ask him questions. Uh, we always take questions, by the way, for these shows. And, well, we did before, but this is a new series. Uh, and, and we'll continue to do so. But uh, you can learn about this and a whole lot more by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. And you got to put all three of those things together because it's the only website that again is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Um, now the research society, that, that money, if you join that goes to the webmaster who's putting terabytes and terabytes of information into the research society. There is tons of stuff there, but there's more being added. Um, not too long ago, there was a bunch of new stuff added and Jordan had to tell me about it on the show that, Hey, look, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there you didn't see before. And I had to go back in. I'm a member of the research society myself and I urge you to join that, but also, uh, anything you can do to help Jordan along or to uh, communicate with him. He's always glad to hear from you, and there's only one place to go, and that is Jordan Maxwell Show, all one word, jordanmaxwellshow.com. 
But uh, this series is on astrotheology. And uh, Jordan has begun to lay out an interesting foundation for it. But I would like to go further into the story. Because the three wise men following the star, or excuse me, the sun <laughs> of God, right? Uh, this is told in the story where the three wise men come and then they deliver him some things. And, you know, there's the celebration. There's a lot of things going on, right? And there's a bit of controversy about it. And here's the funny thing. That story's been told a bunch of times, too. Uh, in slightly different ways, though, right? <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh it, it, it it's again it's the actual deep deep truth that is encoded in there. See again, why do I say that the Bible's not a historical document? It certainly has historical significance because it's been a grand influence over a great many things. Christianity in and of itself objectively you would have to say has influenced the development of the western world. It is, uh, the, the, the symbols have permeated everything. Uh, but then again, the symbols and the discussion really, where were their roots? They have continued to be part of the language, part of the discussion, part of everything. And they were there before. They continue to be shown now. And, uh, there, there is a great deal more to this. It's a very deep subject. Again, why there's going to be a whole series with Jordan on this. So I wanted to get all of that out of the way. And is there anything else you'd like to cover? before we go to break, Jordan? Well, I'd just like to say that I am not trying to <clears throat> become an enemy like the Apostle Paul said to the Christians of his day when he was trying to explain to them things that they didn't know and didn't understand. Right. He wrote like two-thirds of the New Testament. It was written by the Apostle Paul. And he said to the Christians of his day, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The idea is I am not trying to harm anyone's belief system. I'm not trying to uh, belittle anyone's beliefs in their religion. What I'm trying to do is clarify for the audience where the ideas have come from so that you can better understand that if you are interested in worshiping the Lord, so to speak, that you will, for the first time, do it intellectually and spiritually enlightened, understand where things have come from and where your belief systems have come from. Mm -hmm. Then you will understand what you're doing for the first time and be in the light and not in the darkness. Right. You know, an interesting thing, too, I remember a question uh, during the religion discussions, uh, which I don't think we ever fully developed, the, the word worship in and of itself. Might yes, be an I was interesting. going to talk about that. Yeah, okay. Well, I think that we'll begin that in the next hour because we'll take yep, a break here and, uh, and, and continue on with this discussion. But I'd also like to hear a little more about what happens after the three wise men follow the star or, excuse me again, the sun, uh, God's son, that is. Mm -hmm. You know, after that all occurs, you know, what, what happens next, I think, and also the concept of worship and the word worship in and of itself, I think, are all extremely worthy topics. So stick around, guys. Uh, Jordan Maxwell is with us, and uh, we are going, we're beginning today, the series on Astro now, but this is a, a special broadcast. It is a Monday, that's for sure. We have done a lot of Mondays recently with Jordan Maxwell, most of them, in fact, uh, and that was a series on religion in general. It was called Special Dogmatic Theology. Obviously, it is archived here at Ocelli.com. Most of it is up on YouTube. The rest of it will go up soon. Uh, YouTube is giving me trouble, so we will uh, we will straighten that out and get it done soon. And if not, I'll have somebody else upload it, if need be, okay? Because I do know there's another channel out there that keeps taking every one of the Jordan Maxwell episodes and uploading it. Uh, they thought I was not going to be happy with that. I, I do not mind. It's fine. As a matter of fact, if you want to steal this episode and upload it onto your YouTube channel, I don't care. How about that? So steal the episode. This one, however, is not special dogmatic theology. It is astro theology. And this is a different series. This is episode one. 
<laughs> anyway, we've gone through a lot of interesting topics with Jordan. I urge you to continue your studies after the show, as always, and to go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, just in case I forget somehow toward the end of this discussion, Jordan. jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's, period. <laughs> okay, you, you, you'll you see his name in a lot of places on the Internet. That's his website. That's it. JordanMaxwellShow.com is the only place you can contact Jordan directly. It is the only place that has the research society there, the Jordan Maxwell Research Society, which you can join for a one-time fee. Yes, you can go much deeper into these topics, but there is also a public area there. There are streaming videos which you can purchase. You can contact Jordan directly, make a donation, and just frankly, visit, interact, do all that. But there's only one place that's actually Jordan Maxwell's, jordanmaxwellshow.com. So, Jordan, now that I've made sure to get all that out of the way, <laughs> I'd like to get back to this because it, it, it's it's a very deep topic. I know you have some things in mind um, and and the stars, and we, we've given it some context, and I, I like the way this is going so far, and I turn it back over to you uh, to go into the next direction. Okay, uh, in order to understand the word worship, you have to go back to maritime admiralty law, which is another another facet of, of knowledge that most people are not aware of. There's different kinds of laws on the earth, and one of them is called the law of water, and one of them is called the law of the land. And the law of water is international banking law. It's called the law of the sea. And and everything in our commercial world that we live in today on the earth is under international maritime admiralty law, which is the law of banking and money. The whole earth operates under an international law of water. This is why we say your your money goes through your hands like water. No money is water. It's called International Maritime Admiralty Law, the law of banks and money. <clears throat> and our whole economic world system is based on water. And why? Because you go back for thousands of years, the different nations of the world have done business with each other, buying and selling from each other on the high seas, on the oceans of the world. <clears throat> and, and incidentally, the way they did that, the way they were able to do business on the earth, you know, on the high seas, was to navigate around the world, the, the great shipping companies navigated around the world <clears throat> by the study of the stars. They navigated around the earth on the stars. And so the stars became very important in the navigation. And today, the U.S. Navy navigates so many times on the, on the high seas by the stars. <clears throat> and so that's why I'm suggesting that you might want to navigate your life by the stars. You need to understand and for the first time finally understand how important the heavens are over you and your earth and your life because most people do not know how important the stars are to you. Well, <clears throat> uh, many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, the word star which we spell S-T-A-R, was called A-S-T-A-R, Astar. And Astar was one of those little bright lights in the heavens. Star, no, it was spelled A-S-T-A-R, Astar. And so the idea was, thousands of years ago, if you don't understand the Astars, if you don't understand the implication of what the Astars are doing on the earth and how it affects you, then your life is going to be a disastar. And that's where the word comes from. Look it up. A disastar is what happens to you when you do not leave your light. You do not lead your life by knowledge of the stars. Your life will, will become a disastar. 
And this is so true. Uh, so many people today have cluttered up their lives with problems and tragedies and problems with uh, interpersonal relationships and government and law because they don't understand the implication of the stars in your life. When, we, when I was growing up, we used to hear things like, you boy, you think your lucky stars, this and that happened. Well, I think my lucky stars... There is something to this idea that the heavens do uh, guide our destiny as humans. So we're talking about the most important star in the heavens is our sun. <clears throat> and I've tried to establish the first hour that the sun in the human race, in the human family on the earth, the sun has always represented the truth and the light. Because you can show somebody something quickly at night and they may misunderstand what it was. But show them at 12 noon. At 12 noon, show them in the light. And now they see it. Now they can say, oh, I see. Why? Because I'm looking in the sun. It's helping me to see what I'm talking about. And so what I'm looking at, I'm seeing it now because of the sunlight. And so that's why I'm saying that the basis for Christianity is the story of what happens to the human family in relation to the sun. And the sun has, gives us four different seasons. That's why we have four different Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are spring, summer, autumn, winter. <clears throat> and so therefore, Jesus represents the sun. And whatever happens to Jesus happens to the sun. And the sun represents intellectual, spiritual enlightenment. So the most important thing you need to keep, take away from this broadcast is the idea that whatever happens to Jesus is the same thing that would happen to the, the truth and the light. Because Jesus, I, I am the light. I am the truth and the light. Well, there it is. Jesus said, I am the truth and the light. And no man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. And Christianity, un, un, totally unfamiliar with this ancient history, will then tell you, see, there it is, that you've got to be a Christian, you've got to follow Jesus. No, that's not what it means. Go back and do your homework. What is being said there in the Scriptures when Jesus said, no man comes to the Father unless he comes through me, and we're talking about the sun, God's sun, S-U-N, that brings light into the world. And so what's being said there is that nobody is going to connect themselves to the almighty God if you're doing it in the dark, in your silly religion, in your ignorant, ill-informed, unread religious belief. And you think you're going to talk to God? No, if you're going to talk to God, you better go back and do your homework and find out what's really going on. You better get yourself enlightened first before you're going to talk to God. So the idea is, is that most people are in the dark when it comes to talking to God. <clears throat> and so the son is saying, God's son is saying, nobody's going to talk to the Father in heaven Nobody's going to talk to God unless you go through me, the Son. So if you're not doing, if you're not discussing anything with God in intellectual, spiritual enlightenment, then you're not talking to God. You're talking to yourself. You may be talking to demons and devils and spirits. You're not talking to God unless you do your homework and wake up and find out what the world is really going on. So once you really have enlightened yourself, now you can talk to the Father in heaven. Don't come to the Father in heaven with your silly religion, with your particular religious belief, no matter where you come from. That's your particular religious belief of the culture you were born into or what you have bought into, and that doesn't mean it's going to impress the almighty God in the universe. So... And the movie, remember, if, you, if you remember the movie Few Good Men, when the young lawyer is asking uh, Jack Nicholson, he said, I want to know the truth. And, and he said, you can't handle the truth. Well, that's the problem. 
this is a typical understanding of, of Christianity. People today really can't handle the truth. The one thing, and this is, a, I'm going to let you in on a secret that I have discovered after 60 years of talking about this. I have learned <clears throat> that people will always support financially and every other way. They will support what they want. They will not support what they don't want. People will not go to a restaurant to have dinner to eat what they don't want to eat. And they will not go to a dress shop to buy clothes that they don't want. They will only spend money to eat where they want to eat and will spend money to buy clothes that they want to wear, not what they don't want to wear. And so people will spend money and support what they want. They will not support what they don't want. And if there's one thing that history has taught the world, taught us all, is that the one thing, generally speaking, of course not everyone, but generally speaking, on the earth, the one thing humans don't want is the truth. They don't care to hear the truth. They don't want to, they, like the movie said, you can't handle the truth. Most people can't handle the truth. They don't want to believe what they want to believe, and they will support anyone who's telling them what they want to believe is true. So when you go to a church and you believe what the preacher is telling you, and he doesn't know any more about it than you do, <clears throat> but he's got a license from the state to be a preacher, mm. And he's got an imprimatur of the federal government on his name so he can be a preacher. And that way he can make enough money to buy Lear jets and $15 million homes by the ocean. And you just work yourself to death trying to pay your rent and stay alive while he's flying around in jet planes making millions of dollars. <clears throat> so once you see how the system really works then you understand why people don't want to hear the truth. <clears throat> and so Jesus supposedly represents the light and the truth. So if you don't come through Jesus or if you don't come through light, then you're not going to talk to God. You talk to yourself. And so <clears throat> there's a story in the Bible to go along with this whole theme. There's a story in the Bible in the New Testament about Jesus, where he was uh, put under arrest and held in jail, a prison. And, and, and once a year, the governor of that area <clears> that <throat> Jesus was in prison, uh, the, that governor would come out and say to the public, and he ordered, the governor ordered all the people in the town to be there. To everyone had to be there. So the whole town showed up at this meeting that was called by the governor. And, and the scripture says that the governor came out and said to the audience, to all the people of the city, <clears throat> he said, once a year I am allowed by Rome, once a year I am allowed to let one prisoner go. And so that is a part of your custom is to allow one prisoner to be released. And in the scripture, it says that the governor said to the whole town uh, in the announcement, he said, so I have two prisoners here. I have a man named Barabbas. Barabbas, everyone in town knows, is a liar, a thief, and a criminal. And everybody knows it. We all know it. And that's why he's in prison today. Uh, so Barabbas is one guy. He's on the left. And on my right is another man we call Jesus. And Jesus uh, has been doing so many things to help people and you know, to heal people and to enlighten them. So we have two prisoners, Barabbas, which is a criminal, and Jesus, which is the light of the world. Which one should I release to you? And the scripture says with one voice, there wasn't a lot of discussion. With one voice, the entire town said, give us Barabbas. That's a very famous scripture in the Bible. Look it up. Give us Barabbas. <clears throat> so what that is saying is a symbolic story. It's telling you that when 
one family, one group, one organization, one city, one county, one state, one country, or one earth. You get all the people together and ask them, which do you want to hear? Do you want to hear the truth or do you want to hear a bunch of lies? And the whole world will collectively say together, give us Barabbas, Mm -hmm. meaning symbolically people, generally speaking, will join together and say, give us the lie. We want to hear the lie. We don't want to hear the truth. Why? Because you can't handle the truth, like the movie said. So we know now, we now know that that's the way the world is. 99% of the world is not interested in hearing truth. They want to hear what they want to hear. <clears throat> they will finance and support financially what they want to eat, what they want to wear, and what they want to hear. And so then you get the the clergy today, the Christian clergymen, and they are trained in universities to know what to say and how to say it to get you to agree to give them a lot of money. Support the church. Now, God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's wonderful. He's powerful. But like George Carlin said, he can't handle money. He always needs another few dollars. And so that's why today, <clears throat> when 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 the human family is com- is confronted with wanting the truth and the light, or do you want the lies? You want Barabbas. The whole town collectively said, "Give us Barabbas." Why? Because people don't want to hear the truth; they want to hear what they want to hear. And the charlatans, we call the Christian clergymen, they will tell the church people, they will tell the people in the church what they know the people are coming to hear. And so they know that if they tell the people what they already believe to be true is true, and they were they're telling the people what they want to hear, they know the people will shell out money. And this way, the clergy do not have to go to work in the morning at 6 o'clock in the morning and work all day because they can sleep in bed till 2 in the afternoon and just come out and do a little little discussion with the church and they'll make plenty of money and buy, you know, buy fancy cars and jets and live pretty high because they don't have to work. You work and bring the money to the church. Why? Because you will pay to hear what you want to hear and eventually one day you're going to wake up and find out that the scripture in the book of revelation that says get out of her my people if you don't want to share with her in her sins the bible is saying you better get out of her and what is her mother church get out of her Get out of the church if you don't want to share with her all the lies and all the stuff she's been lying to you from day one. And this is why we're now seeing all the sexual perversion in the Catholic Church with the altar boys and all the sexual perversion in the Protestant religion with the all kinds of stuff that's going on, the, uh, the incredible immorality going on in the world today. The church is heavily involved in all of it. And the Pope in Rome was also quit his position of Pope because he was so heavily involved in child trafficking and supplying young children to rapists around the world. Child trafficking, that's the home of the organized crime. Is, is Italy was totally the home of organized crime in Europe. And the Pope was involved, heavily involved with buying and selling children and buying and selling people and white slavery. And he's now been found out. Now the church is being found out what they're really all about. And now all the Catholics that are going to church have to act like they never heard anything. They have to act like they don't know anything about it because the church is so heavily involved in pornography, violence, wars, 
alcoholism and some of the biggest homosexual rings in all of, of all of Europe are in Rome run by the, the Vatican and so there's a world of hurt lies and tragedy because people are in the dark and they want to stay that way they don't want to hear the truth and they will not support what they don't want to hear <clears throat> so that's the name of that tune so from there we go into all the different stories that have happened to Jesus or happened around Jesus or happened to Jesus uh, just remember it's, it's talking about what happens to the truth and the light not to a particular man named Jesus no to God's son represents intellectual spiritual enlightenment and so when you read in the Bible things which have happened to Jesus that's what happens to the truth in the light things which happen around or because of Jesus that's what happens because of the truth in the light so when you see things like give us Barabbas that means that people generally speaking don't want to hear the truth in the light they want to hear lies that's why they will go and vote for their their leaders that vote for their leaders that they know are a bunch of criminals they know that but they want to vote for them anyway and they will fight you if you tell them what's really going on they don't want to hear it they want to believe that their leaders are, are, are there to help them or to protect them and point to fact they just keep doing the same things over and over and over and over and keep elect 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 and always continuing to follow the system and every time they're always getting taken and so that's the whole story of the world the war between light and darkness uh, <clears throat> then we are told uh, another story about Jesus is that we're told that he and his mother Mary now that's an interesting point before we get into the story Jesus' mother is called Mary, M-A-R-Y. <clears throat> Actually, in point of fact, it's not M-A-R-Y. It's Mari, M-A-R-I, not M-A-R-Y. Mari. Mari is a virgin. Mari means virgin, a clean, young virgin is Mari. And therefore, if you have a water, a bottle, a bottle of water, which is extremely purified, we would call it, the water would be Mari water, meaning it's a virgin, it's clean water. So Mari means clean or virgin. And so Jesus is said to be born of a virgin. And her virgin would be Mari, M-A-R-I. Mari is a virgin. And so we today say it's Mary, M-A-R-Y, not M-A-R-Y, M-A-R-I, a virgin. And why why is Jesus born of a virgin? Because it has to do with the sun in the sky and the 12 helpers, the 12 apostles. Well, one of the 12, the chosen 12, is a constellation of the zodiac called Virgo, Virgo the virgin. And Virgo is, is continually always connected to the, const uh, the constellation that brings in spring, at the spring of the year. And so for the northern hemisphere, the sun comes back into the northern hemisphere at what we call the spring, because he was dead in winter. Now he's springing back to life. He's coming back to the northern hemisphere. So therefore, he's born of a virgin. Why? Because Virgo is the constellation associated with spring. So when the, when the sun is coming back to the northern hemisphere, it's bringing light and warmth and, and life and all the wonderful things the sun does for us. It's finally bringing it back to the northern hemisphere. Because when it was in the winter, it was down south in the winter, and all the birds went down to enjoy the summer down in Rio, but we were freezing to death up here in the northern hemisphere. So now the sun has passed over the equator and is on its way back to us in the northern equator, in the northern hemisphere. And this is why today we have a celebration of the Passover, because the sun in the spring has officially 
passed over the equator, mm. coming back to the northern hemisphere. And so the ancient people said the uh, celebration of spring, they referred to it as the Passover. The Passover is when the sun is officially passing over the equator. And so, of course, the Jews will have a beautiful, wonderful story. Like Christians, they make up wonderful stories that has no basis in fact whatsoever, but they have a beautiful story about the Passover. But in point of fact, it's nothing more than the worship of the sun. And so the whole idea, as I said before, I need to get back to it quickly. All of our... Uh, all of our business on the earth is called maritime admiralty, which means that all of our business and commerce is based on banking, on money, and money is water. And therefore, all the ancient countries of the world did big business on the high seas, on the oceans of the world. And so <clears throat> the... The whole idea of international banking is done by water. And so ships were the most important shipping lines and ships were the most important business on the earth between nations and countries were ships. And so today we have the same idea. Anything that we do in this world is a ship. The whole earth is a ship in space. And so you have a dealer's ship a scholarship, uh, you know, a marksmanship, uh, a friendship, and you have something called a citizenship. And therefore, you're on the citizenship. And everything that dealing with, with life in this world has to do with the ship. And so you got all these words that end in ship, like dealership, scholarship, uh, rulership, all kinds of words that end in ship. Well, if you take the word worth, W-O-R-T-H, worth is the value of something. Well, whatever it is that you value, very highly value, everybody's got different things they value. But if you really value something very, you know, very important to you, it's, you show the worth of it. And so you put the word worth together with ship, and it becomes worth ship. Or W O R, worship, and that's where we get the word worship it comes from. The value that you place on some subject is the value of its worth, and so that's why we say it's worship. It's not on your knees worshiping. No, it's showing a value for money, a value for women, a value for whatever it is that's what you worship. That's where the word comes from. So, so when you see the beginning of spring, that's a whole new uh, idea that the sun is now coming back to the northern hemisphere. So we celebrate it. Uh, we call it E-star uh, because the star in the east is now coming back to us, E-star. And so we call it Easter. The sun is coming back to the northern hemisphere. Well, the Hebrews also have the same celebration in spring. And their spring celebration, they called the Passover. Because the sun, as I said, has passed over the equator, coming back to the northern hemisphere. But the, the, but the, but the synagogues will make sure the rabbis have all these wonderful stories about you know, why it's called the Passover. There's all kinds of wonderful stories. But the bottom line is, it's always in the beginning of spring. Mm -hmm. And, the, and of course, the Christians have the same worship of, of, of what we call spring or the Passover. But, of course, Christians can't celebrate the Passover. That's Jewish. And so what the Christians do is they say, well, we have the same identical celebration practically on the same day or the same week of the Passover, but we call it a resurrection. Well, yes, the sun has resurrected from the death of winter, coming back over the northern, uh, coming back over the equator. So we say it has passed over the equator or resurrected. God's son has been resurrected. And so Christians today 
go out at 4.30 in the morning on on Easter morning. They go out about 4.30 in the morning, bundle up. It's cold in the morning. And you go out by the thousands, by the millions, people, Christians around the world will go out and wait for the sunrise. It is called the Easter Sunrise Service. In your face, it's a sun rise service. Right. So we're crawling on our knees to welcome back God's Son, the light of the world, who has come back from the death of winter. And he is now coming back, and so we need to go out there as Christians because we're superior. Our, our, our belief system is superior. So we go out at 4.30 in the morning and wait for the sun to rise. And it's called Easter Sunrise Service. Never even suspecting by millions of people doing such a, such a thing, never even thought about it. You're worshiping Mm. You're showing value for the risen sun, the light of the world. It's all based on the sun, the life of the sun. Right. Well, you know what's interesting here is that actually a question comes in through my Skype, uh, which relates to all this. And I think it's a little bit of a tough question to get to easily, but I'll give it to you anyway because I think it uh, it, it will make sense here. Um, the... The stories of, this is the way the question's written. The, uh, it, it makes sense that if these stories all match up to an astrological, uh, astrologically, excuse me, observable thing in the sky, mm -hmm. that other stories do too. So what about Jesus raising the dead, Jesus giving sight to the blind, and things like this, which are also told in the Bible, they must also be metaphors. That That's the question, Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jesus is the sun and God's son gives light to the world. And so he causes people to see. He, he gives light to the blind. You know, he gives sight to the blind. Well, that's what the sun does. You're blind at night. You don't see what's going on at night. But when the sun comes up, he brings light into your life. He is the light of the world. He gives light and sight to the blind. Right. And so you're not flying blind. You're not walking blind. You've got light. So God's Son is giving light to the blind. Uh, but <clears throat> going back to Easter and the Passover, that idea of the celebration of the sun coming back to the northern hemisphere, we call today Easter. Okay, but in the ancient world in the Middle East, they had the celebration also, just like we do, and just like the Jews still do today with Passover. But they didn't call it Passover. The Hebrews called it Passover. But the ancient peoples called, <clears throat> there was, if you go back to the land of Cana, uh, go back into history, into the ancient history of the Middle East, and to an area called Cana, which is where Israel sits today. Right. The very plot of land upon which Israel sits was referred to thousands of years ago as the land of Cana. And the land of Cana is where Israel sits today. Well, in that ancient land of Cana, there was a celebration of Easter, just like we have today. But it was not called Passover or Easter. It was called the Marriage Feast of Cana. Uh. And that's in the Bible, <clears throat> the Marriage Feast of Cana, where we are told in the Bible that Jesus with his mother went to a very big wedding celebration. Uh. And it was called the Marriage Feast of Cana. And so the marriage feast of Cana <clears throat> was a big marriage feast, but it doesn't say who was getting married. We now know what the marriage feast of Cana was. It was a celebration of spring where God the Father, the male, God the Father, was going to be wed to Mother Earth. Mother Nature was going to take her husband God the Father was going to marry Mother Nature, Mother Earth. 
but you could but if God the Father is going to marry Mother Earth and Mother Nature, they're going to have offspring. That's usually what happens when couples get married. The male man manufactures while the female is in labor. She is producing the product the male has produced. So he manufactures and she is building the product. So for the spring in the ancient land of Cana, they refer to it as the marriage feast of Cana, where we're told in the Bible that Jesus was there with his mother, Mari. Mary, no, Mari. Jesus was there. God's son was there at the marriage feast of Cana. And that, and that marriage feast of Cana was, of course, the God the Father marrying Mother Earth, Mother Nature. And so the story was that, that when God the Father marries Mother Earth, there's going to be offspring, obviously. There's going to be a sexual inter interplay, and there's going to be offspring. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we then see that there's a, a celebration, but you can't have uh, the offspring until after a marriage. So you have to have a marriage first, a legal marriage first. Then you can have the children. And so the idea is, is that God the Father is going to marry Mother Earth, Mother Nature, and she's going to have offspring. And so the spring brings what? The spring brings rain, R-A-I-N, which is fluid from heaven. And that fluid we call rains, for some reason, is very, very powerful. It causes things to grow. Life on the earth grows when it rains. And so the, the sexual union, so to speak, between Mother Earth and God the Father is rain. Interesting that in India, one of the words for God is R-A-I-N, rain. Mm -hmm. Rain was the name of a god. And so therefore, in the spring, we have the spring rains. And that's why today... We have the celebration of God marrying, God the Father marrying Mother Earth. And so the rain comes, and that's the sacred fluid from the male that goes into the female and causes her to give birth to new life. And all of a sudden, all the birds wake up, all the animals awaken, the flowers come out, grass is growing, and life is coming back so God's son that was dead in winter has now, is now in the process of springing, springing back to life. So we call that time of that marriage feast spring. He's springing back to life and God the Father is going to marry Mother Earth, Mother Nature and share with her the sacred fluid from God the Father and the earth is going to give forth her life. And that's well, why if you're going to yeah. be, if you're going to follow Jesus, one of the requirements is you have to go into the water. You have to find a body of water mm -hmm. and go in and be baptized. Why do you have to be baptized? Why? It's because when you were born, you have messed up your life so bad that you need to start all over again. Now that you found Jesus, now you need to redo your life and start all over again. So how do you do that? Well, you go into the water. You go find a lake or a river or someplace and go into the water and they will dump you under the water. You go under the water completely and then you come out and now you're baptized. Why, why are you doing that? It's because when you were born, you came out of your mother's water. The woman, her water broke and the baby came out. So you came out of your mother when her water broke. That's why you're going back into mother nature, mother earth, and you're going to go under the water and come back out of the water, out of your mother's water, and now you're going to be born again. So now you're being born again. So that old life you lived is all symbolically gone. It's all gone. And now you're going to be born again. You're going to live a whole better, better life. So now you're being born again. 
never realizing we're just talking about mundane things in life. Symbolically, you're going to wash your life up. You're going to wash your whole life up. You're going into your mother's water, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, go into our water and come out being born again. Right. So. Well, it's, it's also fascinating to note that, look, you have, you have the time of, of, and this I just note for syncretism because we're going to run out of time shortly and I want to give you the time to do a closing on this particular part. But for syncretism, Let's think about this. Uh, first of all, it's a pagan concept, really, to think about yep. the idea of rebirth at springtime. The fact, I mean, even the word offspring, which I'm sure Jordan just just forgot to mention because he said it so many times, it's coming off the spring. <laughs> I mean, so there you go. Uh, you know, so spring, all right. This is significant for a lot of reasons. Uh, this is the time of rebirth. This is the time of resurrection. Just look around you. The grass, which is brown and dead, will become green and stand back up. Uh, you know, in the spring and why? Because the water came, it landed on it, and yes, it did. It gave it some of the nutrients along with the sun being in a better position. Scientifically, we know this. Uh, you know, again, observable. A lot of animals breed at this time. A lot of weddings occur at this time. Uh, you know, the, the old is just sort of, we you know, spring wedding. modern yeah, why trope. Why do we have spring weddings? Spring weddings are super popular, right? This is the time to do this. Uh, <laughs> why is it there? Well, again, it is the repetition of recognition, right? Over and over again. Uh, the idea that there is life springing from the earth at this time. Even again, my phrase, again, spring. Uh, it, it is, it is just part of what is. Within the northern right. hemisphere, and there's just the way it is, and it's being told to you through these stories. Uh, some of it, like I say, observable; some of it uh, metaphoric. You know, and that's the thing. When when the other person had mentioned in their question about raising the dead, well, if you take a look at what time of year that was done, <laughs> <laughs> and you take a look, you know, seriously, try and create a timeline for the story. And uh, uh, perhaps we'll get into some of the reason why maybe some of the story's missing in the Bible because, you know, it doesn't go all the way through Jesus' life, does it? Really talks right. about the beginning and the end heavily, but you got a few pieces in the middle and then beginning end. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's the way you tell somebody's life story. Uh, and, and besides that, here's the, the fun part is that realistically they don't tell you the end of the story. <laughs> because right. they're just telling you about the cycle of what continues. Now, the end of the story is more like what Jordan was talking about when the sun actually stops rising. Um, that's truly the end. <coughs> Excuse me. That's of the right. story. That's right. But, but that's a story for another day. Meanwhile, uh, so, so all of this stands true and, and, and what goes along with that springtime and that Easter celebration, that Ishtar celebration, that Passover celebration, there's these colored eggs floating around. <laughs> Why? Because it represents, laying eggs represents life. Right. As being born. Uh, you know, the, the animals are laying eggs, which means that now they're being born again. And that's why today we have colored eggs, because that's what happens in the spring. All the colors of the flowers and all the trees and all the colors that the earth is, is capable of, everything is, is, is alive and comes back in color, full color. Right. So the egg represents life being, the new life is being created, so we have colored eggs. And the Easter, uh, the Easter rabbit, rabbits were known to be the most incredibly reproducing animals on the earth. Right. Every time you turn around, they're having more and more rabbits. Rabbits will reproduce continually. And so the rabbit became a symbol for the spring, because the rabbits reproduce. Well, that's what happens in the spring. Everything's reproducing. Right. Well, no, so, and, and, and that's exactly what the point is, is that all of it is actually being laid out in the metaphor. Uh, and if you take a look at it properly, it's really just telling you the story of what is happening around you, what you can observe. Well, Sorry, but here we go. Above and below, uh, you can see what's That's happening right. on the ground, and it tells you the same. And if you put them together, they do sync together. You have, gee, when the star is doing this, 
the star, which happens to be the sun, which is the only star that we got to worry about. When it's doing this, this is what happens on the earth. And it just so happens to coincide with the results of what happens during the story. Now, mm. The concept even that there are – I've heard other presentations too where people have tried to explain the symbols of who it is that was, you know, uh, uh, playing different roles in different parts of the story and maybe they represented different elements of – and, you know, there's probably a lot of ways you can go through this and really make it all sync together. But once you do it, it's kind of fascinating because you're not trying to find historical characters and relics – what you're looking at is the world around you. And uh, again, I think that one of the best places to go to continue to do that is to go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com. That is Jordan's website. That's the only one that's his. The, uh, as I said earlier, and I won't keep repeating myself ad nauseum, but as I said earlier, the research society is over there. I advise you join it. I'm a member of it. One time, uh, a, a fee over there to do that. You can get a lot deeper into this topic, which, Believe it or not, synchronizes with all those other topics. <laughs> so yep. astrotheology is a key, my friends, uh, uh, not only to the knowledge of it in and of itself, but uh, a lot of other things. Uh, as Jordan is beginning to explain, you know, gee, what what actually uh, dictates waters? Well, banks. Well, what's on the uh, each side of a river? As Jordan explained to me a long time ago, they're banks. They're river banks. They guide which direction the Cash flows, don't they? And it's all about the liquidity and so on and so on. Still surviving in the terms, the symbols, and everything else that are around you every single day. And uh, that's how you got to look at this. So, Jordan, I give you the last few minutes here uh, to sort of wrap up this portion. And obviously, we're going to continue uh, talking about this particular subject and tying it together. Um, we do invite questions, which I will take, info at Ocelli.com, or if you want to send them directly to Jordan, uh, there is a contact button over at jordanmaxwellshow.com. And uh, you can contact either one of us or go in the live chat room. I'm going to come up with some other ways for you to do it. But, uh, you know, just let's stay on topic here. And it is astrotheology. And uh, this was the first episode of the series. So, Jordan, anything that uh, you would like to put in here in these last five minutes or so? Yes, I would like to say again, I, was, I want to stress that I am not here to belittle anyone's religious beliefs. But I feel that if you're going to spend time <clears throat> devoting to uh, but uh, devoting yourself to the admiration and the uh, worship of God or to showing appreciation and admiration for the things which God has given us, then you might want to, for the first time in your life, actually wake up to the reality of theology in the world today. <clears throat> Where did our belief systems actually come from and what are they actually in fact based on and while most people have never heard these stories it's, it's all provable true and there's so many documents out, out there about the ancient history of the world about the land of Cana, the, the marriage feast of Cana. And if you remember in the marriage feast of Cana, Mother Mari asked God's son, asked Jesus, when they ran out, according to the story, they ran out of wine. And so it says Mary went to Jesus and said, the party has run out of wine. Can you draw some water and change it into wine? And it said, yes, God's son drew water and he changed it into wine. And the party people said that wine was the best wine they've ever had. Well, what that's saying is that the son, God's son, the light of the world, draws water. Well, of course it draws water. It evaporates water from the ocean. It brings it up and it sits in clouds. And the clouds come over the pasture and the clouds drop rain and the rain comes down on the grapes. And now the grapes are smashed and make wine. So you change water into wine. How? Because God's son drew water 
and, and pulled it up into the clouds. The clouds rain water, and therefore you, you now smash the grapes and you get wine. That's how Jesus was able to change water into wine. And so why? Because Mary was Mary Mari represents Virgo, the virgin, and the one of the 12 signs of the zodiac. It's all based on the life of the sun and our life on the earth goes back tens of thousands of years. It's always been the same story and it's been retold so many times and we buy it as actual historical fact when in point of fact, the whole New Testament is a metaphysical metaphor, a symbolic story about the life of the sun in relation to the life of human life on the earth. And so again, I'm not trying to belittle anyone's belief. I'm trying to explain it to you. And this is what my website does. Go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. As, as you've heard before, that's the only website I have is Jordan Maxwell's show. Go on Jordan Maxwell's show and you will see an advertisement, a little banner that says Jordan Maxwell Research Society. Click on that and join my research website. It's filled with all kinds of pictures and documents explaining the religious beliefs and how governments work and what banks are and where all the research comes from and where to go if you want to do your own research. I give you all kinds of important people to research and important documents. It's an extraordinary collection of wisdom and knowledge that's been hidden from the world. And this is what I love doing. I love to expose the things of the darkness mm -hmm. and bring it to light. And that's what I'm doing with my website, Jordan Maxwell Show and Jordan Maxwell Research Society. So I'm asking you to help me to continue to bring this kind of knowledge to the people by helping me to keep my website going. And the best way to do that is to join my research society because then that gives me enough money to pay my webmaster and it costs money to keep a website up. So again, we'll do this again next week. And I want everyone to realize I'm not trying to harm anyone or to be little anyone, I want to help you to better understand the idea of God in our universe. I right. want to thank you for listening, and we'll talk next week. No, absolutely. Jordan, before you go, though, one thing that you didn't address right there, which I'd like to address quickly, is the fish. And we, we've talked about the fish metaphor because that was the other part of what happened at that wedding, right? Yeah. At that yep. wedding feast. And, and, uh, we, we've talked about it, and there's a lot of, it's not just one symbol here, folks. <laughs> Here's the other interesting thing, just very simple, very short, very to the point. Ask a fisherman, when is it a good time to fish? It's a good time to fish in the summer. Do you know why? Because fish multiply in the spring. That's right. <laughs> so That's it's a right. springtime wedding where the coupling is happening. The idea is that, of course, the fish are going to multiply at the beginning of spring. You, you go and you fish them out in the summer because now they've grown up a bit. They've got something to them, so they're worth catching. But, you know, it's just that simple. Not all fish breed in the spring, but a whole lot of them do. Okay? Yep. So there you have it. It's It's... You know, the miraculous is actually all around you is the concept there. And there's more to that. And I know that Jordan is going to wind up discussing those fish in a future episode as well. And we will continue this next week. But until then, like you said, you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. And uh, I, I would also suggest that if you uh, wish to contribute just directly to Jordan's well-being. You could do that as well. Um, the Research Society is well worth the one-time fee to join. But I would also suggest you can just, you know, drop something to say thank you. If you've learned, if you felt as though Jordan has provided some value to you, I certainly would suggest it. Uh, anyway, that's enough of that. Jordan, I thank you for uh, giving us the time and uh, doing what it is you have been doing for nearly 60 years. Which, uh, which is just simply educating people and, uh, bringing them light as opposed to the darkness that the rest of the world seems to want to deliver. 
So you're right. I appreciate that. I thank you for it, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying desperately to awaken the world and bring light into the world, and I'm doing it at I, I'm almost 80 years old. I've been doing it for 60 years. And I do live on contributions and donations. That's how I live from day to day. I live on on donations and contributions, which are very, very small compared to what I need to pay my webmaster and pay to keep my website going and to pay to stay alive. And so contributions and donations are very much appreciated. And Absolutely. I thank you for you know giving me the time to talk with the with your audience about the things I do. <clears throat> Absolutely.